Welcome everyone to our Nonprofit Tech Club Austin program. We are delighted to have Gina Dillette of Square. Yes, am I pronouncing that right, Gina? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, with us and I wanted to just provide a little introduction to our program and to Nonprofit Tech Club Austin. We've been going for really about 10 years off and on. Started really going strong in the past couple of years, especially since uh, COVID when everybody was at home and so we got on Zoom and that turns out to be a great thing that happened to us because we have had a lot of viewers and uh, participants. So um, here we go. We are part of a network of tech clubs across the nation and across the world. N10 Nonprofit Technology Network, uh, which is based in Portland but operates all over the United States, is a partner in TechSoup Connect, which was formerly called NetSquared. It's just gone through a name change this year. Those are our two nonprofit partners and they provide support all the time as we need it. And uh, programs as a result of being a nonprofit project, of course, are free to everyone. We are entirely volunteer driven and managed and we really, uh, aim to help individuals and nonprofits uh, seeking cost-effective tools and techniques to help make their work easier and more effective. So everybody is included. Uh, all job descriptions are included, uh, development officers, executive directors, IT professionals, and communicators in nonprofits. We don't also, we sometimes have small businesses attend our program. So we really uh, like that because we share a lot of really helpful information for them as well. And this is our slate. We actually wrote it out in a little poster format just because we were so excited. We had such a great year. We're set up through December and looking really good. And uh, we're in our second half now of programs. We meet on the first Monday of each month at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. As I mentioned, we're all volunteer, all our volunteers, um, you know, have wide range of experience and backgrounds. Uh, they donate their time to share information on social, to find speakers and to introduce the speakers like I am today. And our guest speakers speak for free, like Gina. And so we really appreciate everybody pitching in for the greater knowledge of the nonprofit sector. And uh, I urge everyone to support all these great people. Here are our organizers and I put their uh, LinkedIn uh, URLs on here because you are welcome to join with them. If you have a question at any time, please reach out to any of us. And, uh, you know, this will appear in the recording, of course, so if you need to follow up after the presentation tonight, just get back on the recording and you will um, be able to find this information. We also appreciate here in Austin, Startup Hub Incubator uh, Enthusiastic Supporter Capital Factory is our local tech club sponsor and they traditionally have provided in-person meeting space downtown in Austin. And uh, they do have a growing presence all over Texas, which is a good thing. Um, and we've been really grateful for the space. And even though with COVID-19, we had to uh, move online, which turned out, as I mentioned, to be kind of a good thing for us, um, they remained a sponsor and they helped promote us. And we're included on the Capital Factory uh, calendar monthly. So you can find us on their website as well. And here are some links, you, again, on the recording, uh, return to this later, and you can find us all over the place here. And we may eventually adopt some new social media platforms, but right now, this is where we are present. And these are our partners as well. So that's that. Now, I'm going to stop sharing and let yeah, Gina great. Let yes. introduce herself. Yeah, I would love to. It, you know, it's great. So. Um, 
As she mentioned, my name is Jenna Dillette and I work with Square. And um, I also am very happy about being the host of the TechSoup Connect North Texas community. So <laughs> sort of Dallas and broader community in North Texas. And so we just started a little over a year ago and growing our community. And um, it's been great to have Carolyn as a speaker to our club and <laughs> to be part of this national, international um, community of nonprofit groups meeting up and, and getting better tools to, to operate and, um, you, you know, know, try to not reinvent wheels, right? Because <laughs> there's plenty <laughs> of wheels that have been invented. Well, I'm really excited about this presentation today. I've, I've given it a few times because I love the topic. And uh, we're going to talk about relationships and in particular relationship vice and how you can get more from your technology partner because it's very likely that you can, um, whether you even have a partner yet or you've been through multiple relationships, there's always something you can learn and reflection and other people's lessons can, can help along the way. And so um, as a reminder of who I am again, Jenna Dillette, I'll be your matchmaker. So, so you, everyone can watch Filler in the Roof <laughs> afterwards. Um, I like to say about myself that I like people and I happen to work with software. And I think that that's very true. And I think that's very true, especially with this topic and my experience with this topic. And so um, as Carolyn mentioned, I work with Square and we're a company based out of Dallas and serving international national community of nonprofit organization, membership associations. And these are some of the software that we work in, Drupal, WordPress, Civicerum, Salesforce, Lime Survey. Um, we do hosting and maintenance, a long-term support. So we like to be ongoing partners. And um, I, I'm also happy to say that this has not been the first tech organization I've worked with. And I think that that is part of the unique perspective and experience I have in talking about this. Um, and we'll get into a little bit about how you can do the same thing, but in a lot of different ways. And it's those differences <laughs> that can be that perfect fit for one organization in comparison to another. And um, hopefully today we'll be able to kind of hone some of your skills and identifying some of those differences so you can make a relationship or make a change in a relationship that is going to better fit and help your organization go down the road. So who are you? Maybe you are completely solo and you manage everything in house and you don't have anything like a technology yeah. partner or relationship, <laughs> or maybe you're in a bad relationship and you need to get out of it. <laughs> that your tech partner is not meeting your needs, or you just got out of a bad relationship and you're happy to be solo again and doing everything house, or maybe you're satisfied, uh, but you think it could even be better, even though you're satisfied, or you could, you have seen it all because of all the relationships that you've had with different agencies and you should be co-presenting. There's, I, I expect that um, there'll be someone across all of those different points on the spectrum and how you're entering this topic today. And so why this matters is money, of course, right? So the hourly rates of technical consultants can typically be a lot higher than what maybe anybody is making from an hourly perspective in-house. Um, and But also people cost more than technology. We know that. So when you think about the, the people on your team, why these relationships matter, um, also, your tech tools that you have, those are investments, but more than just a money investment, they also normally represent sometimes big process changes for exactly how it is that you get your work done. And that how, the how you get your work done can really change your team structures and even the culture of your organization. And so there's so much that um, is tied into the tech tools that we use um, and why it's important beyond just the, the dollar, which is such the obvious. I also like to point out that um, we're live animals, you know, we're real people. And um, I know for each of us, if we think about what the daily rhythm of our life is like, and um, I know for me, I think about all those little moments. So I ask about a, a three and a six-year-old. And at the end of the day, we do sort of a, a roses and thorns, right? So we talk about the, the really positive parts of our day, the hard parts of our day, and all of those are the little moments. And so just like we're all live animals, we're all real people, your tech consultants, whoever that company is, there's real people there that hopefully you're interfacing with to some degree. And all those little interactions that you have, um, those each add up to make your day better, to make that um, organization, that person in that organization's day better. And so that matters too, right? Can we end each of our days feeling good about the people that we interacted with and the exchanges that we had? Um, if, if there's one takeaway from all of this that I hope that you can have is that there's always another tool and that there's always another provider. And so don't ever settle. And so if you're feeling dissatisfied, you can do something about it. And hopefully um, the talk today will give some of those tools and 
a checklist of sorts for you to know what you can do about it and how to approach it. So I like to um, talk about my sister in this. So she is a nurse, that's her and my youngest son. And uh, she told me about what one of her college professors said when she was studying nursing. And um, her college professor just encouraged all of the students in the class to never settle, that there's so many different types of nursing. And that if you're dissatisfied or you don't feel connected to the type of nursing that you're doing, there's a different type of nursing. And so my sister has been an ER nurse um, pretty much her whole career and loves emergency care, which is a very different kind of care than other types of nursing. And so that has really, that has really stuck with me. Um, or just like having an expertise in, say, thinking from a technology standpoint, having an expertise in websites doesn't mean I know how to set up a sound system in a gymnasium, right? Those are completely different technologies or you don't hire your roofer to be your plumber. Um, and so there's, it's, there's a lot of the same things of the way we think about our technology partners of there's software differences, for example. So maybe um, you have an open source system. So a system that um, isn't owned by any sort of institution or you don't pay a, a licensing fee for it. And that there's a worldwide base of um, developers and supporters who are contributing to it versus a proprietary system that does have a subscription service and has a very different kind of update model. And so depending on what kind of system you even have, that can be sort of the who's doing your roofing job, the roofer or the plumber. You know, there's some, the, the way that you can even complete work in certain types of software is just different. And so um, never settling, but also understanding, um, understanding what you have. And then because of that, who is the best person to talk to because of what you have? So I like to start with knowing what's what and who's who. And so let's pretend like you're just starting out and you don't even have a relationship yet with a technology provider and maybe you're in need of one. Or um, you do have one, but you recently took over the management of what it is that that partner is over. And so I think it's a really good practice um, to be healthfully paranoid, right? So know where your contracts are, or at least make sure your boss knows where contracts are. You can ask helpful, encouraging questions, right? Even if it's not in your job description to really care about or be over. So where are the contracts? What are, do you have copies of the current agreements? Are the agreements up to date? Have they expired? Is there any confusing language? Um, is there anything um, covered that you don't think you're getting? So that's where um, that's where the writing matters. And that's where you can ask follow-up questions. Um, thinking about people in position. So who are the main, main points of contact and what are their expertise? Um, we're all trying to make other people happy, right? And that can impact um, an individual's motivation. So, so if you have hired an agency, how can you make sure that you're getting the benefit of an actual agency and not just one person? And so the, the thing that I like to think about as kind of a trigger that I use is how often is our we statements used? <laughs> like, let me talk to my team. And um, how much of a team does that person have? And it's not, um, I want to make sure and communicate that it's not at all a negative um, to have a individual consultant, right? So you don't need to have a full agency, but also if you have hired an agency, are you able to have the benefit of an agency? And the example of that is what happens if your main point person um, at the agency that you've hired, if they end up end up leaving? So there's a one, um, one thing that I encourage both the, all the organizations, of course, that I would be talking with and what my role is at Square as a software agency is what we are trying to do in-house to make sure that we have a cross-training plan, for example. So let's say for the example, the example that someone takes a leave of absence or decides they really don't want to work with us anymore. And so we lose a project manager and need to hire another project manager in. Ideally, all the clients we work with would not suffer from that, right? They wouldn't then um, have a system that no one knows how to support, but that's on us on the technology side, being the technology agency to make sure that we're doing something internally with our own time that is making sure that everybody on our team is understanding how to support each of our clients. And so there's not this, um, all of the experience and knowledge and strategy of your organization is put in your main point of contact because that just makes the investment that you have um, that much more risky if that one main point of contact were to leave. And so thinking about 
a question to a potential um, consultant or a potential agency could be what does cross training look like internally or how do you make sure that if if the main point of contact I have leaves that then I'm not having to completely start over with somebody else on your team and that secures your investment. Um, I also like to think about the breakup clause. So how easy is it to end the relationship? So that's why having a copy of your current agreements matters. So is it a yearly contract? Is it a, um, a certain days or months notice that's required? Is there some sort of refund that's on to, because of a deposit that you'll get back once the relationship is ended? Um, is there anything in the, in the contract about who owns the data or who owns the software? And a lot of just knowing some of that landscape is a way to avoid a nasty breakup, right? To and a nasty breakup can include a surprise invoice that you did not know was going to be part of trying to end services or needing to have um, a longer time in order to end services than what you were expecting. So potentially having to sort of double pay for services if you're transitioning to another technology provider, but still have say three months that you're having to pay on your current relationship. So that's a lot of um, what's in that, in that breakup clause of how can you end the relationship? Because what is the term of it? When do you have to give notice? What sort of deposit do you potentially have on file? Um, for communication norms, it's really good, just like it is good to know who your main point of contacts is, it's also good to know how to communicate with that main point of contact or with the team that you're going to be working with. So for example, do they have a project management system or is email the best way or is there a phone number? Who does that phone number reach? Is that a generic person or is that your main point of contact? So just knowing what those communication channels is very valuable. A lot of these tips can also be kind of flipped back as a mirror on, on your own organization and your own structure. You know, what contracts or agreements do you have in place? Who are the main points of contact for the individual functions that relate to technology? How do you communicate together? So there's a lot that is valuable externally when starting a relationship with a technology agency or maybe resetting a relationship with a technology agency that you're already working with. But there's also a lot that can be used internally to make everybody's time more efficient and effective. Uh, the final point on this one is just knowing about the emergency response. So let's say you have a um, a significant and very time sensitive concern. Do you have a means to escalate that, to get that 30 minute to an hour notice? Is that part of an agreement with you have with them? If it's not part of an agreement, what would it look like to have that in place? Or what would be examples um, of how the partner that you're working with, how they have been able to respond um, to other clients when emergencies have come up. And um, I think part of this is also to hopefully get rid of any sort of fear or discomfort or that it's inappropriate for you to ask any of these questions to the technology agency because none of this is personal, right? This is all the paperwork. These are all the checks and balances for how, um, how agencies run a business. And um, I, I know I personally really like the kind of competitive nature of software. So in the earlier slide, looking at, I know the, the platforms that we work in, for example, there's a ton of shops that specialize in WordPress and Drupal and CiviCRM. So there's nothing unique about the software, for example, at Square that we work in, but it's how we work in it, right? That we like to think of as a differentiator. And so whatever systems you have, even if you've never heard of these, you have completely different systems, it's very likely that there are multiple agencies that um, could be supporting you and that that's a good thing, right? Because that should um, apply some healthy pressure <laughs> to then on the agency side for us to make sure we have our act together and constantly modifying what it is that we're doing so we can better support our clients. And so um, any, any of these questions, I would encourage you to be bold in asking them and they're not personal. You're collecting information in order to set a solid foundation in order to hopefully build a relationship that's going to be mutually beneficial. So next, thinking about the pricing structure. So the, the past was a lot about the, um, the different communication norms, the contacts, what the language is. When we think about the pricing structure, just like I mentioned that there's many, many other Drupal shops out there. Square is a Drupal shop. There's lots of other Drupal shops. We can all deliver work within the same platform, but in completely different ways, right? And a lot of those completely different ways can come down to how we're communicating differently or what our communication 
tools or practices are, but also what our fee structure looks like. And so it's um, completely normal and likely expected that if you have, um, say, a project that you want to implement a new donor database, within your organization and you start to collect bids from organizations, from agencies to potentially partner with you to build that out, um, it'll probably be an apples and oranges experience because you may see very different pricing structures that can make it hard to compare. And so if you kind of use a list of looking for, okay, are there any kind of one-time initiation fees, which would be different than say a deposit. So a fee that you are paying to the agency that you are not going to get back because that's just sort of a one-time setup fee, for example, versus a subscription fee that you get maybe a set amount of services and you play, pay a flat rate for every single month. Even if you're using say more services in one month, fewer services the next month, um, that's a little bit similar to kind of having the retainers or a deposit on file that then you can kind of pull against of the services that you use and then the way that that time or those services can be tracked against money that you already have on deposit or on file with the agency. Another big difference in how agencies can work is whether they work under fixed price or time and materials. So for example, at Square, we do not do fixed price projects, we do time and materials. So I like to think of that on working time and materials, that it means that we talk about money a lot more, but it gives you a different kind of control over your money. So a fixed price project would be that, okay, you need this new website, for $5,000, you get to have this new website. And that's the that's the full amount that you're going to pay so whether or not for that agency that agency ends up able to deliver that website to you in the cost for them of only three thousand dollars so maybe that's their two thousand dollar profit or it was a it was a um, poor estimate and it actually takes them fifteen thousand dollars of their cost you still only pay ten in comparison to time and materials it would be how much it takes. And so you'd still get an estimate and it would likely look more like a range. And so maybe it would be eight to $12,000. And then if it comes in at five, you pay five. If it comes in at 15,000, you pay 15. But so the communication and the checkpoints are likely going to look and feel a little bit different between something that is a fixed price proposal versus a time and materials proposal. And so when you're talking with agencies, it's really good to understand, especially if you're um, getting bids from multiple and they work in different ways, it's very good to understand, um, especially those communication norms and check-ins and how much control you have and visibility into the time that's being spent and what is delivered because those two models are very, very different. And from the technology perspective, I've, um, I've worked in both models. And so even from the implementation side, I know um, the differences that exist and there can be just a, a better fit for some organizations within one of those models and other. And it really just depends on what you need, which is why there are so many different business models out there supporting the exact same software. Um, there's a, a lot of pricing structures that can also have a variety of add-ons. So let's say this is our base package of services. And if you also want, say, SMS messaging, text messaging, or if you also want to use outbound mail services or have some sort of marketing campaign support, maybe those are fixed add-ons that could be paid on at a subscription base. So maybe monthly, or maybe it's a one-time. And so the, the pricing structure is what can make... Um, Two agencies that work in the exact same software look completely different, where this is an apple and this is an orange. And so knowing, um, knowing what your organization is and um, what kind of communication and involvement, say your boss or your board of directors, what they are expecting can help inform which of those fits is going to be better. Because there's nothing inherently good or bad in terms of making one of those better than the other. That's why both models exist or all these options exist. And understanding the differences and how they best relate to your organization is, is what, what will make you able to make the best decision. So one example I like to think about is the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers. And I know in the past, they used to have some language in their contract and they use software that is all open source, meaning that there's no one that owns the software. And they had some language in a previous contract that um, it was a kind of a guarantee language that um, their system should work as it was intended or built. And so that ended up being very tricky language because when 
the, um, the technology partner who's serving this organization and their technology partner in implementing new functionality or training them on functionality, when they're doing that within software that they don't own as a technology agency, they're developing within it. Um, and then something happens to break within the software. Maybe there was a new update, but it's supported by kind of a worldwide base of developers. And there's kind of a core team of developers that are fixing it, but it's not in that wheelhouse of, um, of that agency to actually fix that. That's where kind of the software type that you have can make a big difference. Sometimes there's something like a patch. So basically something that um, fixes the issue that could be sort of applied within the system. Sometimes that patch that would be needed hasn't been developed yet. And so organizations will sometimes either have to wait or finance for that to be developed um, in comparison to if it's a proprietary system, kind of putting the onus back on that one entity that has the kind of the controlling power of, of most things about the software. And so from a, from a language perspective, that was poor language in a contract that didn't really fit the model of what the way open source software actually works. And so, so there needed to be some re-education and a change in model on the, on the software delivery side to make sure that it's clear really what is billable versus really tricky guarantee language that from a, a technical agency standpoint, that doesn't back up. And then that means probably spending too much time for free, which then puts a relationship at risk, right? Because everybody needs to be able to pay their team. So that's, a, that's another reason why knowing your contracts, knowing the kind of system that you're using and just asking questions when you don't understand, no reason to ever apologize, just get clarity. And if the answer doesn't make sense, ask again in a different way and make, make people spend the time to answer your questions. Because again, that's another way to build a solid foundation. So now let's think about your organizational structure. So you, you've had all these agencies you've looked at this, this uh, fruit basket, your bananas, your apples, your oranges, they're all different. And then what what is your organizational structure? I like, I like this graphic of the real organizational structure of kind of, you know, how we all blur and work together. <laughs> and so um, kind of the next step and whatever your role is in this process. So if you're seeing, say your boss or a coworker leading this process or you're leading it or you've experienced it in the past or you have a staff member who's leading this, of get buy-in and see where buy-in is happening. So like I mentioned in the beginning, Technology, this conversation matters because it's money on the table, but it's also because these are the systems that allow you in many ways to do your work, to show the relationships that you've built and record those for the next generation of staff that will be working for your organization. There's no need to try to download somebody's brain because hopefully with a good CRM system or good note-taking practice, a lot of that history and context and relationships has been stored somewhere. And so understanding who is impacted by the technology you are working on, and then the consultant that you are hiring. So making sure that you're getting folks at the table that are going to be impacted. And how are you going to be working together? And so I like to think about the rules. For example, we work with a lot of organizations in supporting their CRM system. So whether it's for event management or membership management or donor management, having the internal structures and rules for when we create a new group, this is how we name that group. That that kind of process that's very distinct for one organization is going to look completely different for another organization. Their naming structure for how they name groups should be different because of the way maybe for them, they have sort of three distinct teams working in a CRM system. For another organization, maybe it's five distinct teams, or maybe it's one person who's doing all of it. And so all of that does need to be different and should match your work. And getting those voices at the table as early as possible can help set everybody's expectations and just have a greater buy-in. So the delivery is something that people are expecting. And, and then the, that management of change can also be easier to then ideally expect more from your software, right? That I, it can likely do more than it is now. And that just takes um, some elbow grease some reading documentation, some um, being bold to ask questions and seek out help. And you probably have a lot of the, um, a lot of the tools at your fingertips with the systems that you already have with that additional digging and buy them and excitement from your broader team. This is a, another example of an organization we work with where they have very distinct teams um, that 
do very different things as a lot of organizations do, but of course they're using the same systems. And so one of the ways that they have handled that internally is having a kind of a scope of work or SOW structure that defines the work that needs to be done and having an estimated hours approved for that. But then those conversations and those SOWs being organized in such a way that the teams are coming together. So when we meet with this organization, for example, we're not meeting with just one team, like they have the marketing team and a survey team. So we're not just meeting with the marketing team. The survey team also needs to understand and know what it is that we're doing with them because it's within the same system. And then that can also help with prioritizing what, what matters and what needs to be done first, especially when there's going to be an overlap of functional use in the system. And so, um, so I really like that example of the, your technology partner, you can also use them as an excuse to have your teams communicate in a different kind of way, just because that's also a way to save time, right? If you're doing more of your own project management internally, in terms of how you're going to use the systems, why you need them to function in a specific way, those are just going to be more questions that your technology partner is not going to have to ask because you're coming to them with, this is what we need, this is how this other team is likely going to use it, and here are some times that we'd all like to meet with you to understand any questions you have. That's much more organized than starting from scratch and having the technology partner wonder is everybody at the table that needs to be at the table? Um, because that is hard on the technology side too, the technology partner side too of, we don't wanna feel disappointment, right? We don't want our clients to be disappointed or, or for us to discover that an entire team was left out that we didn't even know existed at an organization. And so there's a lot of questions that a good, um, a good project manager at a technology partner should be asking to help make sure you're getting everybody at the table, especially at these initial and key decision points. So expectations can be managed because the happier everyone is at launch, the better it is, right? Then you have a showcase and an ability of a case study or to help with the sales process for the technology agency so they can maintain a strong and stable business model to serve you and other organizations. So you've signed the contract, you found the right partner, you've got a bunch of buy-in, everybody's excited at the table. And so now what? So I think of this as interaction tips. And the first thing is getting it in writing, thinking back to that, um, that healthy paranoia, right? I, I think of it, I tell my team, I want it time stamped. And what they know what I mean by that is you said it on the phone, but did you follow up and also say it in an email? I like to be able to reference back to decisions that were made. And especially when, as is often the case, you have multiple things happening at once. And when you have, say, a larger technology project, it often doesn't get to be your full-time job. You still have your full-time job that you're doing. And you have this kind of this one-time five-month project that you're also working on at the same time that you're having to fit in, that's a lot of things to remember. And especially if you leave or your role at the organization changes, or you decide that you want to spin off and make someone else internally more responsible for pieces of it than what they have been before. If you get it in writing, that's going to be a lot easier to transition and communicate. This is what the plan is. This is where we are within the deliverables. And also hold your technology agency accountable and make them earn whatever that rate is, right? Because like I said in the beginning, a consulting rate for, from a technology agency is likely going to be higher and for good reasons than what someone may be if you're, if you're in a sense paying someone internally that, um, that rate full time, right? That would be, that'd be a very different kind of rate for what an internal resource should be. The other thing is, is looping in others. This helps to share responsibilities and ensures engagement. And so that can make sure that you're giving your boss or you're giving your coworkers or other team leads an update on the project. They don't even need to ask for that, right? You can, you can do that in advance and have that as part of a standing uh, full team meeting that happens weekly or monthly or whatever your internal communication rhythm is. Looping in others communicates the value that you're of the systems that you're working on. I think because of COVID, we all know and appreciate the value of what our technology does for us in a different kind of way in terms of communication because of the remote nature of how everyone can still thrive. Because whether I'm not in three-dimensional or on a camera, my brain still functions, right? I don't need to be in person for my brain to not function <laughs> or for my brain to function correctly. So looping in others ensures that, that they're engaged. Um, also thinking about the learning curve. So 
So part of keeping others engaged and sharing responsibility is that we're not always good at um, explaining the value of what some things are that we bring to the, that technology brings to the table. And so understanding the end result of why you're wanting that project or why you're wanting that new functionality in the first place, connecting the why for, for the work that's being done can help everyone think critically down the road for what could come next. And also make sure that you're um, spending money in a way that it really is bringing value to your organization. It's not just something that you happen to see some sort of article on that looks like the cool new tech thing. Well, if it doesn't have any relevance for your organization, <laughs> that's probably a poor investment for your organization. And ideally a really good technology partner would ask some of those critical questions too, because they don't wanna just burn money because at the end of the day, some executive director, some somebody is probably gonna notice, why are we spending so much on technology if we're not getting any difference or value in the work that we're doing? So that's where there's a, um, I think of that as the healthy tension that ideally would exist between an organization and the technology partner that they have, that both are asking um, hard, honest, good questions of each other and none of that needs to be thought of as offensive or too personal or you're just trying to have the best and most honest relationship and hold each other accountable to the work that you're doing together one way of doing that is troubleshooting and i'm going to get in um, a little bit to the weeds of troubleshooting better which relates to the kinds of communications you can have with your technology partner but first, I wanted to also share about IMBA. So they're the International Mountain Bicycling Association. And what I like about them is, and it relates to um, Looping and others, is that uh, at a regular interval, they have two board members that are actually part of the calls that they have with us. And um, I know that that only that would only work when in some organizations right in other organizations that level in, of involvement would be sort of inappropriate or beyond um beyond what is appropriate for that organization and what the board does but for imba that has worked really well and what what that has allowed is having two of their board members jump into the weeds of these calls where we're talking about the specific things in the system that we're troubleshooting or the new functionality that we're implementing all of that has significant value because they're getting to know a little bit about the team, right, which is different than the executive director. They're seeing some of the team that their executive director is managing in action. They're seeing how we, the technology partner, are communicating back, how we're prioritizing. They're able to ask questions in real time about the system and kind of push the edge of what's possible and have a voice in that space as well. But also they don't have any of that decision-making role, right? It's a very defined role that they have on that call, but the ability that, that has, especially in a remote space for um, board members to be up to date and spend valuable time and contribute their skill set to the organization and for the staff to feel really supported and that their board really understands and knows and cares about technology, that's a significant relationship investment of how people are spending time. And so whether that is other members of your team and it's not a board or it's an external um, advisory group, so maybe they don't even need to be board members. Maybe you have kind of a, a tech council that is supporting your organization. Engaging some of those folks can be such a great way to have new volunteers that bring a lot of value to your team. And it also helps spread that awareness about the value of the work that you're doing and also the stability of the relationship that you're working within. So now, I, now to jump in the weeds of troubleshooting. Um, this is just because I fielded a lot of emails with very confusing questions in them over the years. And so I wanted to just remind some of that troubleshooting 101. And, and some of this is starting from an assumption that you're thinking about some issue in your website or your CRM is acting funny. So the software, this, these are software issues. So describing your problem. What were you doing specifically when this happened? And what did you do to get to the place that now is gone awry? You know, what were you clicking on to get there? And then what happened? So was there a specific message? Can you take a screenshot of it? What made the thing that happened unexpected? Um, the example that we would often get is that the donate page is broken, period, right? Period send. <laughs> like, well, what does broken mean? If I go to it, the page loads, I could press a donate. What, what about it 
is looking broken. I know sometimes that means that um, language is off, right? Sometimes someone is sending that to me and really they just wanna change the language on the donate form or they wanna change the donation options. Um, so the, the next things that you can do is testing your access. So does it look the same even if you're in the same browser? So maybe you're in Chrome or Safari or, or Firefox. Is it functioning the same within those, within those spaces? Or is, if your website is broken, right? If you can't access your website, can you access it from your phone? So is there something that's actually happening with your internet connection that your phone being on satellite isn't having? And that's sort of the internal troubleshooting. Is there anything happening? For first. So timing trends, is this, does this always happen at 3 p.m. no matter what? Like, is there some sort of weird thing that this happens every single day that's good to know about? Um, how long did the issue that you experienced last? Was it sort of just one little hiccup, like one little blip? Or is every time you press reload on a page, is that same issue popping up? And so the things that you can share are taking screenshots, um, copying, pasting the URL that you were at, doing the quick one, two, three steps of first I went to this page, then I went to this page, then I did this thing and this, this weird thing happened. Kind of laying out those steps of, of what it is that you were doing and also what you were expecting. And all of this, what it does is it saves time. So depending on what your support relationship is, right? So maybe no matter how much lack of detail or detail you add, maybe it doesn't affect what you're going to pay because of that different business model and pricing structure. But in other circumstances, if your technology partner isn't having to hunt a lot of this down themselves and making guesses at what might be wrong, then that increases your ability to communicate, right? And likely the problem is going to be solved much quicker because it's understood much quicker. And so there's a lot that um, an agency, they need to ask that healthy tension, right? The accountability back, but there's also a lot that you can bring to the table when you're wanting something to function different than it is or something to be fixed or resolved or modified to um, be different than how it is now and the details for how we communicate about that. All right, so now, now that we know how to troubleshoot and we have these great relationships, <laughs> how do you figure out what you need? <laughs> so I think of this as the um, defining your functional requirements. And I put functional requirements in parentheses because I know I've experienced often there is, um, there can be an expectation that um, a nonprofit main contact who's going to be the main contact working with the technology agency has the answers already of how the thing needs to work. And that is not your role. It is not your job to define the technical requirements of how the thing is implemented. Um, if you want, if you want a blue toothbrush, it is the toothbrush manufacturer's job to figure out how to make that thing blue, right? You don't need to tell them how to make it blue. It just is important that it's understood um, what success looks like and what the end results should be. And so a good example of this is user stories. And so user stories are just a really nice plain language of when I I am someone who's navigating, I'm on my phone and I want to be able to make a donation that I can make every single month auto renewal and I want to make sure that I get a receipt at the end. Well, that defines kind of a functional experience for what that user should see when they take out their phone and they go to a donate page and they're able to make a, um, an auto renewing donation and they should get a receipt. So I can think of from a technical perspective, the different pieces that would need to be involved to achieve that workflow. And so defining your um, understanding who your target audiences are. So who is your website serving, for example, or your event management system? What are the different audiences that are coming to that system? And then what should the user experience be? What should that story be? That kind of narrative of that person using the site? What are those expectations? And then sharing that with your technology partner, then they can fill in the technical specs, the, the technical requirements in order to achieve that user story. And it doesn't need to be um, the, other, the other way around. It's also a good practice to share what you don't want, right? And uh, an example of that, so I, I often like to collect examples of websites or systems or online experiences that an organization really likes. So show me other people's websites that are an inspiration to you. Also show me systems that you really don't like or that made you feel confused. And then it's, it can be my job to figure out, okay, I'm seeing some of these differences because for you to understand this is why I didn't like that, that can be a little bit harder to tease out sometimes. But if you share enough examples, 
then the technology partner will hopefully have enough experience to be able to understand and see in a quick glance or with visuals why something is better than the other. And that can really inform and really help the final delivery that's given to then your team. The US Chess is a, is a really great example of this. So we did a pretty big project that took over a year to implement where we kind of threw in a sense, like kind of everything up in the air, right? So they had these proprietary systems that we were replacing with standard open source tools. So ma management and ongoing maintenance could also be standard and done by multiple people. So because of the kind of the unique and custom nature of their previous systems, it was just one or two people that were ever able to complete an update or knew kind of the backstory of how the system really worked. And that was starting to get really costly. It, that's the sort of thing where that person really never gets to go on a vacation and they definitely can't retire. And so by having a system that then is more standard, then more people can hold the responsibility. More people can share, um, share the load of, of, of updates. And so what I like to think about with that organization, what I told them in the beginning was kind of thinking about different banners that we that I would mentally hang on the wall when we were going through the functional requirements and what those user stories are. And so some of those banners were trying to make things as self-service as possible. So making it easier for that, that chess player in their home on their iPad to do more things themselves instead of calling the office for maybe this list of things that they used to do. So in a lot of ways, this changes, like I mentioned, that the tools that you use can also inform and really modify the way that your team is even working together to deliver your mission. And that all of a sudden that can change your culture too. So for the nature of US Chess, this, the, the new system that was built using standard open source tools to replace the um, custom built system that they had had for decades meant that as an organization, the membership staff that used to do much more manual entry of data and manual adjustment to data all of a sudden became tech support. So when you have a banner hanging in the wall of self-service, that means people in their own homes, on their iPads, they can take many more actions on their own and they don't need help from an office. They don't need to call a number. But when they do call, it's because something is confusing. It's because they hit a screen and they don't know what to do next or they hit a screen and they clicked a button and it didn't do what they thought it would do. So thinking back even to troubleshooting, there's a lot that as your systems get a little more complicated or if you start having more self-service elements of your system where your users can do more of the things um, that they need to themselves and they don't need that guidance, when they do need guidance, they're, then all of a sudden you're the one who's helping them troubleshoot to try to understand the issue that maybe you can solve on your own, maybe you escalate to the technology partner you're working with. And so having those kind of banners in mind when you're thinking about whatever the scale of project is that you have, and then knowing a little bit about how, depending on what that banner is, how it may change the nature of what your team is doing, that doesn't mean that it's eliminating jobs, but it could be changing job descriptions. Um, going from that kind of in the example of US Chess, a lot of people doing much more manual data entry to all of a sudden fielding member questions who uh, don't remember and don't know how to reset their password. It's no longer the, the individual staff member's job to create the passwords. It's guiding that user through the process on the site. And so that's a very different way of spending time that inevitably can have a big impact on the culture of an organization. So having all of those things on the table when you're implementing software, like I thought it was just a donor database and now our organization is completely different. Well, that's a little bit of why, because the way we spend our time and communicate together then impacts the way those minutes, moments, every day goes by in our team. So looking a little bit at warning signs, you'll see a few of these before, and hopefully a few of you get the fantastic Star Trek <laughs> reference. Like I mentioned before, those we statements, when there's really not a we, and it's maybe just a, an I, um, but you are paying for an agency. So I wanna make sure and clarify again, I don't think one is better than the other. It's more about making sure that you're getting the value of what it is that you're paying for. And so being aware of we statements and who is, who is delivering work. And if you're getting the full kind of delivering attention of the team. So a lot of that is getting things in writing, documenting when um, there was agreed to dates, agreed to deliverables, which I think of as kind of having it time stamped right. And then um, following up and asking questions like, oh, I see Friday has passed and I was supposed to have this thing on Friday. What's what's the time frame on when I'm going to get that? Um, that? That is absolutely your role 
if that is your role, <laughs> but that's absolutely somebody's role within your team to ask those kinds of questions and expect accountability. Um, thinking about who's the guinea pig. So this is an example of this is just understanding if the thing that you're wanting your technology partner to do, have they done that before? And you know what, it's okay if they haven't, but it's more helpful for you to know if they haven't. And that can also help reveal if there's going to be any, any surprises, any roadblocks that neither one of you were expecting because we're in experimentation. And that's where um, having that relationship, ability to be honest, critical, ask questions of each other, um, you can hopefully get a sense of that, of if this is the first time that your partner has done that. Um, attention to responsiveness. Are people replying to your emails? Are you getting your phone calls back? And if you're not, it's okay to complain and do something about that. And it's okay to also look elsewhere. Because um, depending on your system, like I said, it's very likely that there's a lot of other agencies that could provide you services. So don't sit and feel, um, feel abandoned for too long before really doing something about it, especially depending on what that pricing structure is. If you're still um, paying that say monthly retainer out the door at a fixed amount, but you're not getting your emails responded to, take action. It's a uh, businesses naturally understand that they need to be competitive against each other and stay on top of their game in order to deliver services. And so you're helping push an organization, push an agency to make some of those changes that they need to make in order to get back to the level of responsiveness that they need to have. And in general, if you see any new alerts in your system, right? Like warning, security update required. And if security <laughs> updates are supposed to be done in your system, well, there's another check that you can see and say, hey, screenshot, I saw this in the system. Is there anything I need to know about? And that can be the quick way for the agency to say, oh yeah, we're scheduling that for Wednesday. Thanks for pointing it out. There's nothing you need to do, something like that. But there's um, to, to don't be afraid to ask, I guess. So, so to, you know, the summary of you have opinions, share them. You can also develop by example. So thinking about all of these organizations, they each came to Square where they really liked, there was this other system that was inspiring to them and how could they have that, right? It's like these, these wheels that we can just constantly reuse, 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 and that we don't need to invent on the own. And um, that there's a lot that could be possible with your system with some additional training. And that's where um, joining groups like this where you can get to know other nonprofit leaders, get to know other um, folks who are working within your same role in other organizations and how they've solved problems is such a great way to take advantage of the tools and the resources that you have within your own organization. And in conclusion, how do you get more out of your technology partner? Just don't be afraid to ask questions and have greater expectations of what your software can do for you and make people earn their money, you know? And everyone at the end of the day, your relationships are gonna be richer. Um, they're, they're going to feel like valued colleagues and not someone that you're dreading to contact. If you're dreading to contact them, well, shoot. Google some other <laughs> Google some other providers, <laughs> and to have your needs met and and your dollars spent um, in a better way for your organization. And so just just don't be afraid to ask questions is the biggest and to put things in writing. And so I I love this topic, <laughs> and I would love if there's any kind of follow up questions or how to troubleshoot things because it's very likely that any um, any partner that you're working with now that relationship if it's if it's struggling in any way having that kind of direct conversation where you ask some of these pointed questions could likely turn that relationship around. And maybe you don't need to go shopping at all, but if, if they don't know that you're dissatisfied in some way, but you are, not letting that build and addressing that earlier to reset that expectation is just gonna mean that you can probably do more with your system, have more fun, and then focus on the relationships, on the work that you're doing to have the impact that your organization is having. So it's been mm -hmm. a pleasure. To be here. I'm really thankful, Carolyn, that you invited <laughs> and look forward to, yeah, to hearing from anybody who has follow-up questions. And if not, hopefully it means that everybody is kind of straightening up the relationships that they have or has a better tool set for evaluating um, technology partners that they may work with in the future. Yeah. And anyone uh, watching the recording of the program tonight, uh, you can email Gina. It doesn't have to be right this minute in the comment field. Yeah. <laughs> you can just email her later. But I have uh, some experiences that really bear out what you said. I do a lot of troubleshooting and major gifts and 
will traditionally go in for several months or a year or a couple of years or something like that and run campaigns, but always run up against a WordPress website or, you know, the constituent management system. So one example is uh, I was working with a really promising startup, not afraid of all, at all of technology. And they engaged a, and got a grant actually to create a new website. And so a really kind of expensive company, I have to say. And um, so fine, we were in the midst of that. And we had an emergency happen, actually. And I had to change some data right away on that website, like right away. And we didn't have any kind of emergency, you know, clause mm -hmm. or anything like that. Who thought of it? We never thought of that. And we should have because... The kickback email we got was, I'm on vac vacation in Cancun and I'll be yes. back in seven days. And so I kind of reached out to other people. Nobody at that firm could help us, you know. And uh, I was so angry that I actually make WordPress websites myself for some nonprofits, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I got online and created a new website and I gave it to the executive director the, the next week. And I said, look, I made this in two hours. And she goes, I actually like the way that looks. Yes. <laughs> Meanwhile, we were paying $50,000 over the course of a year for a website, yes. a database. You know, it was more complicated. There were many features, but basically the emergency clause is really important. Then Another place I went, I was trying, this is, was like an incredibly brainy arts group, okay? Mm -hmm. Very aesthetic and smart and uh, smart when it comes to art, but not technology. So anyway, they had like literally data all in a bunch of little pieces, you know, in files and different places in the building and in people's minds. So my greatest accomplishment probably for them, one of them anyway, was getting it out of people's heads and onto a chart. Yes. But I said, let's consider this uh, constituent management system. So I helped implement it. And, the, you know, the director and I talked, it's like, fine, it's great. And the uh, chairman of the board actually approved it. Okay, so when it came time for the person who managed tours and the other person who managed um, direct mail and mailing lists and uh, other things, they didn't want to learn how to use it. And you know, you have to learn it to use it and their functions, oh, a gift shop manager, okay? So it could do, it could, it could launch rockets. I mean, yeah. it, it was really a great platform and they just, it didn't matter that the chairman of the board and the executive director and I running the major gifts for a year um, wanted it and spoke highly of it and were really encouraging and trying to get everybody on board. So the buy-in thing, the whole yes. buy-in, no matter what you're doing when you're getting into a new technology, you need to go beyond those people to make sure that um, you have buy-in. And we actually, another group I worked with the, a board member actually researched donor constituent management platforms and came up with one, which was great. And when, and it had been sitting there a year when I came on board to work on major gifts. So I get in there and they were mailing, oh, they had about a 3,500 person list in there, including the donors all mixed in. And uh, I would say two thirds were all out of date. The emails yeah. were going to space. So I literally tore it apart and put it back together. I, I just, I reinvigorated the whole thing. So it's really started working, but basically the board member was for it, but the executive director was like, yeah, I, don't, I just don't want to do it. And uh, the program people who needed to put in input, who was volunteers who are working, what projects they're working on. That. Again, the buy-in all the way kind of from the top to the bottom because it doesn't matter what level of the organization you're in you can have a lower level employee just really cause a lot of problems because if they're not going to use it if they're not going to take time they never have time or they somehow don't have time they should have the time but mm -hmm. 
but sometimes they, I've actually had some of them say, well, this data is so important and I don't want it being in this database because other people will see it. <laughs> Which then there's always options for that too. That's one thing, not every system has that, but that's a question that I ask is about permission control. So I remember I was working with one organization that they really did have like true celebrity donors, you know, people like, I know that name. I think I saw that movie with that person. And it was important that they hide the contact information of some of those folks to only specific members of the team. Yeah. And while it may not be possible in every CRM system, it is very possible in some, and that's where asking those questions getting the training. We didn't talk about training very often, but your, your comment about spinning up a WordPress website so quickly and not being able to get any help from this professional agency that's supposed to provide these services. That's where <laughs> I try to be really aware and upfront with our clients about um, kind of pulling back the curtain, the Wizard of Oz curtain and like this is not complex and then making it a choice that it's completely fine if, if an organization doesn't want to understand how to update the language on this specific page. But what is not fine is for us on the technology agency side, for us to, in a sense, keep that as this very technically complex thing as if, oh, well, yes, we must do that for you. Instead, mm -hmm. we can do that. Here is how we're going to do that. We um, if you want, instead, we could provide a 15 minute training for you and a recording of the screencast. So in the future, you can do this yourself. That's something that I know that gets more of kind of to a values and much more how I personally show oh. up for work. But this idea of yeah. um, that's, that's not the good. kind of money that on the technology side, I'm not interested in making those kinds of dollars. I know at the end of the day, doing that kind of work could in a sense result in more billable time. But frankly, that's boring. If we're just changing text on websites or that, and that should be the easiest thing for an organization to be trained on. There's all kinds of different levels of what can be done within your system. And I'm sure that there are things in everybody's system that there really would need to be a developer, but that's a very specific type of change. And otherwise there's a lot of training that could be provided to probably meet a lot of those needs that exist within their intermediary. And so that kind yeah. of pulling back that curtain is so important. That way you can know for sure that you're actively choosing to have and pay the money for your partner to do that work that you could do in house. And that's completely fine, but it's less fine if it's sort of conveyed in a sense that they are the only ones who you can, who can uniquely do that thing. <laughs> Cause if you can be provided well, with training on that and that training can be stored for you or for any member of the team, mm -hmm. that also is going to be a longer life and a better use of those dollars by the, by the partner you're working with. Well, my, I actually did get them to train, to let me get in the back end to, to be able to make those re really relatively modest yeah. text and update up the dates of the events or changes. So um, they did eventually do that. Um, so I guess I would say it, it eventually worked out, but uh, I think that is something for uh, firms to know from the, other side. The thing yeah. is, they didn't realize I was really a good hacker. So I was actually able to kind of get in there <laughs> and deal with it. But uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I could have goofed something up that they had beautiful thing that they created, of course. But um, the other thing I think, though, is where um, I really think uh, so many nonprofits that I run into that I, because I've I meet so many and I, I help untangle things, but they, they have gotten so excited about new technologies and they've just like pieced them all together. And they have all this, this horrible COVID looking like disease <laughs> framework. I mean, it looks like a ball with stuff sticking out. Yeah, and well, probably uh, someone who was there for two years that came in with this system <laughs> that they liked in the past. I mean, that's where paying attention, anybody's time and investment that they spend in trying to clean up and better understand the system that already exists instead of bringing in a new system is such a gift to all future team members. Because I don't remember now yeah. what the um, what the rate of turnover is now. Is it two or three years, two to four years for well, turnover? Which I don't know. It's for, for development officers. It's like, 14 months or something. It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. But so here's that's the those investments, those notes, you know, in one system, that's such a gift to 
the future people who will hold your job. <laughs> right. I mean, it's just um, you. There needs to. This is like if you have your own. You know, you have your menu of things that Square provides. But I would say, I assume you might have one that is. Help me figure out what systems actually do go together. I like this yeah. one. Here, I like Mailchimp a lot. Does that go with Z2 Neon? Or yes, Black that's the great. Or... That I think that gets in so much to the strategy <laughs> consultation side because what we often see is that, especially if an organization really does have multiple software, multiple systems, it could be that there are components of software that they have that's duplicative. So for example, if I can go to the settings of a software and kind of enable a new component that is already part of the software that it just hasn't, that checkbox hasn't been checked for that to be enabled and enabling that doesn't change your pricing fee, there's no reason to then, unless functionally somehow it's so different, there's no reason to then pay for that system within another space. And so that's what we'll often do as um, we think of that as kind of a functional audit, functional system audit. So what are the things that you need done? And then what tools do you have that are doing those things? And sometimes yes. there's going to be things on that list that these are the things we need done. And sometimes there's no system that's meeting that need. And other times we see this is a system that's meeting that need, but this system that you have could also meet that need. So then it's a, it's a comparison of, do you then stick with the system that you're already using that's meeting that need? Or do you just enable that component within this that could consolidate? And then maybe you can get rid of that subscription, that monthly $29 or whatever it is um, that you're paying for oh, that. We, I've seen that over and over again. And uh, that's one great thing to kind of close on with like TechSoup. I mentioned this in a prior program, I think, but Basically, there's so many great tech discounts. Yes. And the other thing is I often do see this. Um, I'll get on the budget and see that a group is paying the full rate for a commercial QuickBooks mm -hmm. for a year. And I, I ran into, and they just felt they wanted to be so professional. They were really well-meaning. But basically, a tech soup, it was something like $80 a year versus And it's a free membership, too. <laughs> right, yeah. and it's free to get it, you know, just yeah. sign up on the platform. So I guess I would say, you know, it's good that you are helping the tech clubs and the tech soups because there's so much. If, if you kind of did an audit, you know, of all these sometimes incompatible systems and kind of came up with, well, maybe you want to look at it this way and uh, get rid of that one and put this one in put constant contact in instead of mail or whatever yeah it is. yeah i think that would be incredibly helpful that's just me going in <laughs> and and having to untangle it myself and i'm like this does not work it's just that i'm tech set tech inclined and i have no fear of technology so yeah. i'll just act and it, you're not afraid out. to ask those questions you know you're not <laughs> but i but really questions. <laughs> they need professionals to do that not somebody who's a hacker you know <laughs> yeah yeah that's a that's a really that's a really valuable important point and i think that's where starting from what you have and understanding it better is going to end up being better than trying to start from scratch um because then you can better know exactly why you're dissatisfied with your current system. If you still end up being dissatisfied with whatever tool it is that you're using, it's good to know why, uh, because a good technology partner is going to want to know why. So then it's not a churn and then you don't end up dissatisfied with them too, because nobody wants that, right? <laughs> that's, that's not going to be stable for either, either partner. So. Yeah. Well, thanks, Gina. That was so helpful, man. I think every nonprofit, but you get, you know, you apply to have a nonprofit, you get the legal designation, and they say on that form from the federal government, this is what I want to say. And now you need to have a technology audit and decide what it's, yeah. what you, what is going to make your operation work best for you and all the systems that'll integrate. Because yeah. I can tell you, it's wasted time. <laughs> if you are, are not, you know, options galore. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There are so many choices and sometimes you just really kind of need a few. Yes. So, Agreed. But you have to have somebody smart to look Finding at Finding the right partner. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Getting more out of your relationship. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll post this uh, recording soon. So well, you will see it on there online Great. on Facebook. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so <Carolyn>. much. <laughs> Bye. Take care.